All right, so welcome everybody. Thank you so much for joining today. Uh, CHPCA, along with the Canadian Network of Palliative Care for Children, uh, we're really proud to be hosting this panel discussion, this free webinar, in honor of National Children's Hospice Palliative Care Day uh, that is celebrating the amazing work that palliative care teams uh, do every day to help uh, families and children with serious illness. Um, so thank you so much for joining us. Uh, we want to start off thanking our sponsor for today's webinar, Children's Healthcare Canada. Thank you for your support. And uh, so today we have a wonderful panel of three families uh, from across Canada uh, that are going to be sharing their experiences and uh, a few housekeeping items. And then I will hand it over to our wonderful moderator. Uh, so you can ask all of your questions in the chat. Feel free to ask them as the webinar goes through. We will have a question period at the end, and we'll go through as many of the questions as we can uh, that were asked in the chat at that point in time. And uh, I want to also give a disclaimer. What we're talking about today shouldn't be taken as medical advice. If you need medical advice, please uh, contact your healthcare providers. Uh, they're going to be best equipped to give that advice to you. The webinar is recorded and we will be circulating the link to the recording to everyone who registered and we'll also be providing it uh, for free on our resource repository that CHPCA and uh, CNPCC that we uh, created on the CHPCA website that provides resources for families and healthcare providers to talk about uh, pediatric hospice palliative care team, uh, pediatric hospice palliative care in general. Uh, so the recording will be available on our website as well. And uh, before we dive in, I also just want to uh, begin by acknowledging that CHPCA and our team, we work on the unceded and unsurrendered territory of the Algonquin and Anishinaabe peoples. Uh, we encourage everyone here to take a moment to honor the Indigenous peoples uh, who are the traditional caretakers of the land that they are on. And with uh, all that being said, I will hand it over to our wonderful moderator, Celine, and uh, have a lovely webinar, and I will see you again during the question period. Thank you so much, Kat. So hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining. It's really great to see a really good turnout for today's webinar. I'm happy to have you all here. So my name is Celine Derubis. I'm a registered nurse and also the educator at Roger Nielsen House in Ottawa, Ontario. Um, we are one of the pediatric hospice facilities in Canada, um, along with a few others. Um, it's an honor to be moderating this session today and to be joined by these three lovely, lovely ladies um, who will be sharing their family's experiences with pediatric palliative care. So before we hop into the questions, I'm just going to get them each to introduce themselves and we'll start with Barbara. Uh, thanks, Celine. Um, uh, my name is Barbara Mohan and um, I, my son Jasper uh, passed away at the age of 15 with end of life care at Connect Place in Vancouver. Um, we had been in cancer treatment with Jasper for about 18 months um, for a brain tumor. And uh, at the point where his uh, the treatment options were no longer curative and he was considered terminal, we got transferred um, to Connect Place for our care. So at the time we were living quite remotely um, from Vancouver, about 200 kilometers and about a five hour trip by car. Uh, so um, we got a lot of remote support in the beginning from Connect Place and eventually um, actually, I, I think it was a month of remote support and then a month uh, living, a month later, we, we made the trip to Connect Place for end of life care for Jasper and we were there for about 10 days. So our relationship with Connect Place was quite short. Um, and then once he passed away, I became involved with Connect Place for a few reasons. Uh, I was invited to be part of the Family Advisory Council there. And the one of the reasons I got involved is because at that time, which was 10 years ago now, so this was in 2013, um, adolescent support or support for adolescents and end of life was kind of in its infancy and I was um, hopeful to sort of improve resources for parents who are having adolescents in end of life care. Um, I also at that time the remote care model for Connect Place um, was fairly skeletal. It's, it's grown a lot since then so I was 
concerned about parents getting more support if they didn't live in Vancouver. Um, and finally, I was interested in more bereavement support because being in a small community, bereavement support services were also limited. So those were the reasons I got involved. And then after six years of serving on the Family Advisory Committee at Connect Place, um, I was recommended to be a, a board member at Connect Place to be a liaison between the board and the Family Advisory Committee. So that's currently my role with Connect Place. I sit on the board and then I am liaising between the board and the families. Uh, advisory committee to make sure that families are always front of mind for for the board members so and i'm pleased to be here we're happy to have you here barbara so thank you so much um we'll go on over to karina for an introduction hi my name is karina letcher i'm the mom of five boys and my journey with Connect place started many years ago um about eight years ago in fact um when my middle son heston at the time he was three when he was diagnosed with um, a rare disease called San Filippo syndrome, also known as mucopolysaccharidosis type 3A. And so while he was born seemingly normal, at that time of diagnosis, we knew that over the years he would lose abilities, his disease would progress to the point where it would no longer sustain life. And so we spent the first number of years at Canuck Place when he, um, I think we started when he was four. At the time I had two-year-old twin boys as well, and 13 and 10-year-old boys. So we as a family grew up, my boys grew up at Canuck Place doing respite for many years. Um, it was a real source of um, just entertainment, but also just comfort for them. And so over the years, um, Heston's disease progressed. And so at different times, we, were, we relied on Connect place for various symptom management, just help with medical advice as we navigated through his illness. And then um, back in June of this past year, he we spent the last two weeks of his life there at Connect Place as a family. And um, it was just such um, a meaningful time for us. All of my boys, no question, they wanted his life to be finished there and wanted us to spend that time together there. And so, um, yeah, so we've traveled our whole journey with my son Heston seemingly with Connaught Place. And um, we live in Victoria, so we are a little bit remote from Connaught Place. It's a ferry ride and a drive. Um, so we also relied on 24 hour phone lines at times and just um, lots of kind of remote care as well as in person care. Thank you so much, Karina. And I'm happy that you're here and that we can get more into your story today. And then the last person we have joining us is Amy. So I'll pass it over to you. Hi, um, my name is Amy Manning. Um, my story is a little different. Um, I'm based out of Ontario um, and I had uh, my family and I had care with Emily's House Children's Hospice. Um, so our daughter Grace was born uh, 33 and a half weeks. So we had actually been at our last prenatal class and I wasn't feeling a lot of movement. So our nurse at the end said, you know what, why don't you go up and just get checked out that way you won't have to worry. And 45 minutes later, um, I gave birth via emergency C-section. Um, so she was immediately transported uh, to sick kids. And from there, two days later, uh, we received the devastating news that she wouldn't um, survive. They weren't sure how long we would have. Um, and we started the process of making all the hard decisions. Um, and so we actually were referred to Emily's house by one of our nurses. Um, they were about to take out her feeding tube. And I, at that point, realized that this was the start of the end and that I didn't want her life to only be in a hospital. And so I had a little freak out and said, wait, 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 um, you know, I, I wanna take her home. And at that point, that's when our nurse had said, we can certainly assist with that and we can take you home or there's this other place I'd really like to be able to tell you about. And that's when we were introduced to Emily's house. And we were fortunate to be able to take her there and spend uh, five days with her there. Um, and that was, that, that was her home. Um, we weren't able to make it home, but I wouldn't have wanted her to live anywhere else. So um, we are very fortunate that all of this care was fairly close to us. We're about 45 minutes north of Toronto and um, we were welcomed there. And um, from there, after losing her, they were a great support system. Um, I am now sitting on their family advisory committee, which was started 
uh, two years ago through the pandemic. And um, I will also be sitting on a new council um, that is a mix between sick kids, Emily's house and a new perinatal um, program that they're running. Um, and I've also done work for the pregnancy and infant loss uh, pale network through Sunnybrook um, doing bereavement support groups um, and some other volunteer through them. So um, for me, it's about just one, making sure that Grace has a legacy uh, beyond just the, her short time here. And also to make sure that um, children's hospice care is spoken about. Um, it's something I knew nothing about prior to needing it. And it's a place you don't ever want to have to know about, but if you need it, it's, I feel a place that everybody should know about. So I'm very thankful to be here today and to everybody who's attending. Um, so thank you so much for having me and I hope you all find something um, to take away from this. You're very involved in a lot of programs, Amy. So you bring such a valuable perspective to the table today. So thank you. Um, so I know I'm personally very interested to hear more about everyone's perspectives and experiences. And I know many others who are here today are as well. So thank you again for being here and sharing your very intimate and vulnerable stories with us. Um, you are all helping us to build awareness for pediatric palliative care services, and you're also improving the quality, quality of living and dying for infants, children, and youth with life-threatening conditions and for their families. So I think we can get into the questions now. Um, and to start us off, um, my first question is as follows. So everyone has a very unique story and experience with palliative care. Can you share with us what the beginning of your journey looks like with palliative care and um, maybe just expand on it a little more throughout and um, really no order. Maybe we can go in the same order. So we'll start with Barbara. So um, we were given, Jasper had had some deteriorating symptoms after his last radiation treatments. And so we had been admitted to hospital and we had received sort of the conversation that his, there was no more curative treatment for him in hospital, which was sort of a devastating conversation. And I, in my memory, it was either the very next day or the day after that, that um, Connect Place staff uh, came to our hospital room and they came with Poppy, um, who was a Connect Place um, dog, <laughs> and uh, which I can't, I can't emphasize how much of a difference that made to the whole tenor of the conversation and the feeling in the room. So, um, so they came into our room and explained to us that we would be referred to Connect Place um, and that uh, it would start off with a tour and then it would uh, from there, it would go to like a test weekend where we would stay for a couple of days to to um, learn about the house and the services there. And uh, and so um, we we also, I guess, before we were discharged from hospital on that particular visit, we had a, a coffee in the coffee shop of the hospital uh, with uh, Camara, who was going to be our main support contact when we went home, um, remote contact. And we talked a lot about that, about how remote support was going to work and that we could phone her or email her at any time of day or night and she would respond. So um, so those were kind of our first uh, interactions with the level of service that we were going to be provided there. So I will say that because we were from far away, we had spent 18 months living at Ronald McDonald House. And so we knew about Connect Place. And in our minds, Connect Place was the place that you went to die uh, because everybody from Ronald McDonald House who went there died. So um, that's uh, it was a significant barrier to our ability to really embrace what was offered right at the outset. Uh, we didn't want to be there because we kind of knew what it would meant, what it meant. So um, our tour wasn't great. It was uh, I mean, it was a great tour, but we weren't feeling great when we were there for the tour. And even when we went to stay for a weekend, it was a bit reluctant. Um, but by the end of that, I think that we were, we could see um, Jasper's symptoms increasing and we kind of knew the value of what was being offered there. And, and it, it took that, that period of time was about six weeks between when we heard and when we actually stayed for a weekend. So there was this, a, a really big shift in um, how we had to think about the care. And so, uh, and that was difficult. And so I would say to my former self, you know, the sooner you can make that transition to embracing that form of care, the better, because it's just an amazing level of care. Um, the other thing that I um, learned since is that our, our perception of Connect Place was really driven by, like I said, this experience of living at Ronald McDonald House and then having to switch, um, switch streams, so to speak. But when we got to Ronald or to Connect Place, and since then, I've, I've learned to understand that palliative care means a lot of different things and it means basically quality of life support for um, many children through the bulk of their lives, which can sometimes be decades, like families are involved with up to for up to 20 years with Connect Place. So 
<clears throat> it's really not just the place you go to die. It is really the place where you get um, the best quality support that you can to live your best life and for your child to live your best life um, with the time that you have. So. I love that you mentioned that palliative care is more than just um, what some people think it is so much appreciated. Uh, thank you for sharing, Barbara. Uh, we'll move on to Karina to answer this question. I just want to add, like, I totally agree with Barbara. We spent years experiencing that um, Canuck Place helping us live. And um, so our story is a little bit different too. Uh, my son was diagnosed and um, we had one-year-old twins at the time and just were just trying to manage life and get our heads around the fact that our son wasn't going to live past his teens. And um, so we kind of were navigating different doctors, trying to figure out what we needed, what my son needed, what were we gonna need in the future. And um, living in Victoria, we hadn't really had any contact with Canuck Place, except that my husband and I were huge hockey fans. And so my husband says, I think there's a place called Canuck Place that I've heard of. Maybe that's something that we should be navigating because um, I know hockey players sometimes visit. <laughs> and so we, we were like, okay, well, let's look into it. And we, um, we went to a doctor at BC Children's um, at the time and we asked and she actually said to us, well, I don't know what you would, what you would need from there because you're from Victoria. I don't know what you could use from there. And we were like, well, I think we'd still like to try it. And as it turned out, we had another doctor later that said that the first thing he asked us was, are you connected with Canuck Place? Cause that's where you need to be. So I really did depend on the medical professional that we were visiting of their view of Canuck Place. And, um, but I have to say, um, it did take us a little while before we, we booked our first visit um, for some of the same reasons as Barbara, we just weren't sure. And our son seemed very far from end of life. And so it just felt like, our, should we be going there? I know there's respite. I know this is available to us, but is this really what we want to do and want to bring our other kids to? And um, so our first visit, I mean, my stomach was just, <laughs> I didn't know, I, it, it was so hard just to go there and just to, I felt like, what am I going to see? Who am I going to talk to? Um, but after being there for, our, I think our first visit was about five days, we, we knew that this was a place where they were going to help us. This was a place where they, um, they had seen San Filippo syndrome before, which none of our doctors locally had. Um, and so right away, we knew, okay, they're going to help us. They're going to help us through navigating all sorts of things over these next years and they they did thank you karina the first visit is always very difficult for many families i hear so um, i'm happy that you were able to get have a positive experience and then continue to go um, and amy you are the last one here so i'll let you take the lead here yeah so um i think it's very um I think it's great that we have so many different perspectives and so many different scenarios um, through the three of us. Um, we obviously had a very short time span um, and we were living literally decision to decision and moment to moment. Um, I had an emergency C-section, so I wasn't even down at the hospital with Grace um, till a day and a half later. Um, and it was the next day that we received the news and we never expected that she was going to die. We figured, okay, there was some complications and there's some issues and we may have some disabilities we need to deal with, but that's fine. She just needs to, you know, she was born at four pounds, four ounces. She was a good sized baby. And so we thought we were getting out of this. And so it, we were just hit with a brick wall when they told us that she wasn't going to survive. And so from there, we, it was like getting our families down to tell them and um, then making those decisions of taking the breathing tube out. Is she going to make it through the night and going through those steps through the hospital? Um, and so it was kind of a very much a big blur. Um, I don't remember a lot of it. And like I said, it wasn't until we went to go and do that um, feeding tube that kind of everything set in. And we hadn't been talked about at all about hospice care or, or what would come next once, you know, would we be able to leave the hospital or not? And um, we were very fortunate that one of our nurses and her nurse, when she came in, um, had worked at Emily's house. And I, to this day, still believe that if she had not been our nurse, we would not have ended up there and our lives would be very, very different. And so she just needed that in of me asking the question about where we could go next. And um, 
she very much advocated on our behalf. So after she kind of told me about Emily's house, that's when she was able to get the PAC team involved. And then they moved very quickly. It was a weekend. So she didn't want us stuck in the hospital over the weekend because they didn't know how many days we would have. And so she actually stayed up with us after her shift and arranged um, to take us, she got the approval to take us to Emily's house via um, taxi. And uh, so we hadn't done any visits, no site visits, hadn't even been on the internet, nothing. It was blind and it just sounded like the right place for our family. Um, and until we were in that taxi going, and I actually had that kind of moment to think about what was happening. Um, I got extremely nervous. Um, you know, you know what you know and what you don't know is very scary. And so I started second guessing everything and was this the right place to go? What was it gonna be like? Exactly that, like, is it just gonna be a bunch of kids that are dying? Um, and I really started to freak out. And um, once we got there and we walked through the door, um, it was just this night and day moment. Um, it was the first time that I felt like a mom through those days um, because nobody was running up to us to, you know, take the baby or anything that way. They were all coming up and going, oh my God, she's so cute. And oh, what's her name? And, um, you know, oh, like I love her nose and she's got big chubby cheeks. And it, it was just, it was such a different experience. And as soon as we walked through the door and that happened, I was like, we're in the right place. Um, and they just the energy um, and you know you know the hospital and so you kind of think that that's going to be similar there and it's not it was it like it was like going home um, and we had a huge family meal they cooked us a meal that night we had been running around through hospitals and everything through the day and I couldn't remember the last time we ate and they made this big meal for our families they welcomed we had friends that had been down visiting and everybody was welcomed in and it just it really felt like going home and we knew right away that it was the right place for us to be. So I am forever grateful to Nurse Stephanie for making sure we got there and got there in time. <laughs> nurse Stephanie sounds like a very special nurse. So I'm super happy that you had her um, to walk alongside you during those difficult moments. Um, and then with that being said, it leads us into our next question. So despite the difficult days and moments during the illness journey, we can still hope to have some positive experiences. Can each of you share with us what some of the most influential, influential changes in the care that your child received um, that happened once the palliative care team got involved were? Um, so I guess I'll go first. Um, uh, there's a number of different things that were, that were I guess, significantly different from care that you get in hospital because um, that's the, the comparator that we had. And so one of those was just the way team meetings happen. So um, we would we would be participating in these really large group meetings with all of the care practitioners at Connect Place. And the focus of the meeting was instead of us listening to the healthcare professionals tell us kind of what, it, what was happening with the disease or what was going to happen with treatment, the it seemed like the mode was asking us what how we were doing what we wanted what we needed like it was really focused on us um, uh, directing the care which took a little getting used to because you're kind of not used to being in that director's seat and it's, and it's a really difficult time to be doing that but um but it really was focused on uh, checking in with us every step of the way and and asking us all what do you need what how, you know how can we support what do you need um and then uh, we transitioned from that sort of to remote care. And again, I think I've mentioned like Camara was on the phone or on email with us 24 seven. So, and there was a lot of, especially at night, there was a lot of, um, that's when pain is sometimes worse. And, you're, you know, you're trying to struggle, trying to get your child to sleep or something like that. So um, there was a lot of support given in the middle of the night, which was great. Um, and then once we, um, and I guess what that enabled us to do at home was spend more time on the things that were important to him in his last uh, months of life. So he had a list of things that <clears throat> he wanted to accomplish and we were able to focus on those. So when we, we did go to Connect Place because the burden of care at home was too great and my husband and I were exhausted and we were, um, Jasper was having falls. And so we, we just decided, okay, we gotta, we gotta go um, and at least get some symptoms under control. And so, um, but when we got to Connect Place, um, that time, which was for his end of life care in the end, um, 
there was just this uh, lifting of burdens and, and again, letting us focus on being parents and uh, loving our son instead of having to do all his body care and all, all of his medical care, um, which is what you're kind of in charge of when you're at home. So, um, so yeah, I just, um, I think that that comment that Amy made about being um, allowed to be a mom. So that, that was really important. And we didn't have much time of that. Like I, I had been in sort of caregiver mode for 18 months. And so, and so those last 10 days where I didn't have to do that as much were hugely important. So that, that would be the most influential change. That's definitely a big change. I imagine probably very difficult to get out of caregiver mode as well. So, yeah. And there were, there was a lot of give and take on that. So like there was, he was a teenage boy and he didn't really want female nurses and other people yeah. like bathing him and dressing him, but he was still okay with me doing it. So there was a lot of um, understanding and, and um, um, compromise around, you know, what, what do you want us to do? What do you want to do yourself? But I was able to give over a lot. So, yeah. Good. Good. All right. Um, Karina, I'll pass it on to you. Yeah, so we were um, involved so early with Heston's diagnosis that um, at, for there wasn't a huge change at the beginning, except that they really helped us kind of get the right people in the right areas of his care. And they really helped us navigate what did we need to have um, lined up for him? What are the things that he's going to have issues with? They knew what was his projection and they had seen what he his disease so they were such a guide to us as to the things that we did need to worry about and the things that we didn't need to worry about because a lot of our um, doctors were unfamiliar with his disease so it just they were kind of the guide they were the stable for us and we did have numerous um things throughout the years we had one um period in particular where he had had a surgery that was supposed to be just routine tonsils adenoids removal surgery ended up having major complications swallowing that surgery we had a long hospital visit with you know every 12 hours being a different doctor on shift and just we he wasn't getting better um it was just it was awful and we were able to go to them because we were already part of their program and they were like, okay, we need to get you here. And we, and sure enough, we got there. They knew him, they knew his disease. And within a week, they had, they had it figured out and they really helped us. And so those were things that if we didn't already have them in place, I don't know what we would have done. And so basically we would navigate his changes. You know, he all of a sudden was having seizures. So what do we do with that? Well, we, we had our own medical professionals that did things but whenever we got to a point where there was just questions he's not getting better he's not improving not you know we always had them to then be like okay we need your help we need and they were there to help and I just I look back on his life and think I don't know how we would have navigated what he had and what we went through without them they were just our constant and um so and as we got near the end I mean they were his care and we would always say that um, as we get, got to the nearer end of life, they were our caregivers are like, well, we were, I was a caregiver, but they were our medical professionals for everything. And so they were who we went to. We went there for numerous days. They would monitor him and try and help us navigate what would be best for his comfort. He had, um, for his last year, we, we really struggled with lots of different things. And so they, they were our go-tos. I'm so glad to hear that you had that constant support from them. That's amazing. All right, and Amy, over to you. Yeah, so I think um, I echo a lot of what Barbara said in terms of we went from doctors telling us what was happening and what we needed to do and the decisions we needed to make to a team asking us what we wanted and how we wanted things to be done. Um, and it was very much um, on our timeline. And so, you know, it was more about us having that time with her, having our family there. And, you know, obviously some things needed to be done, but um, it was, okay, we can work around your schedule. So what, what do you want to do today? How do you want today to be? And we'll check in with you. Um, one of the great things was that it was the peace of mind um, because she, and she was off of all machines. So um, we didn't have any machines, no beeping, no tubes, nothing. So we just got to hold her and 
she was just a baby and we got to have that experience with her. Um, but we had that push of a button that if anything happened, if anything went wrong, if we were, you know, if I freaked out about something silly, I could just push a button and somebody would be there instantly. And our first night there, um, we used that button several times. Um, and we were never made to feel like, why are you bothering us? Like it, it felt like they were there for us. And it, you know, the first time I was like apologetic cause I had just freaked out and, um, and they're like, no, like this is all new. You don't know, like, and that's why we're here. Never like bought, it's not a bother. And so it just felt so welcoming and so controlled um, that, you know, they were there in the wings if we needed them. Um, and otherwise they were just unseen. And the, having that peace of mind, it just, it really allowed you to live in the moment. And we hadn't felt that at the hospital. It was, you know, in the hospital, it was constantly making those decisions, wondering and waiting. Whereas there it was, everything was on your timeline. And if you needed to talk to somebody, there was somebody right there to talk to. If you had a question, if you wanted to go back over another question, um, they were always there with that information. So, um, and then for us as a family, it just, the, the um, comfort for us not being in a hospital room where you know you're sleeping on random chairs or standing in the corner or getting pushed out of the way during certain things um, we had a beautiful room uh, we could sleep <laughs> not that we did much but if we wanted to we had space um, so again it just it was that home feel and I think that's for the for us that was really it was our home with her and um, I know I've said that a couple times already but it just that that's exactly what it felt like. And it was so comforting. I'm glad you're saying it again and again, though, that it felt like home because it should feel like home. And that's what we aim for with the pediatric palliative care hospices. So I'm happy that you had that experience. Um, okay, so you all somewhat touched on this, but the illness journey can be a very difficult uh, path to walk through and to navigate. As palliative care providers, we hope that we can walk that journey with you so that we can provide support and provide the best possible care to children and families at every stage of the illness journey. So what did palliative care provide that helped you to make every day count together as a family? So um, our support was really divided into, there was this like when we were at home, which lasted for about, um, almost six weeks, maybe almost two months. Um, and during that time, Jasper was able to do a lot of things on his life list. So he had a cardboard box war, he did a radio program, he went to do some pottery at a, a clay place. Um, we got an aquarium, we moved into a new house and he got to buy furniture and set up a room. Like, it, like the amount of stuff he got done in six weeks was just kind of incredible. So um, that support allowed us to have all those memories and experiences and how, allow him to achieve some things that were really important to him. Um, when we got to Connect Place, um, there was sort of a period of time that was difficult with symptom management. And then there was a, at some point, he had asked to be sedated because we couldn't get any good pain control any other way. So the last three days of his life, he was essentially sedated. And um, so we had a chance for some peace and some privacy. Um, we were able to trade off in his bedroom. There's these beautiful gardens at Connect Place and we spent a lot of time in them. It was summer, so they were in bloom. So it was just wonderful there. Um, we were allowed to pull our, push our beds together with him. So when he passed away, we were all in bed together. Um, we were not in a place at that point where we were reaching out for support. Um, we were quite, I think even before he was sedated and then those last days, you become quite inward focused. And so during that time, actually there was a chaplain and a counselor who just, they, they came in uninvited and they just told us how, what a great job we were doing. And it's kind of a strange thing to be told you're doing a good job while your child is dying, but it's really that encouragement and support was huge because you are navigating something that almost nobody ever has to navigate. So just having someone come in every couple hours and say, you're doing great. <laughs> Was, was just really important. Um, and then even, um, even after he died, I was given so much time with him. Uh, there was none of this, oh, we, gotta, we have to prepare him and take him away. I was given a lot of time, which was 
in the end really important because he'd been in a lot of pain before he died so we couldn't touch him so being able to touch him after he died was huge so um and so those are those count for me as family time yeah that should definitely count as family time that's really special and um just hearing what jasper got to do before he passed is really meaningful and um sounds like he got to do a lot which is great thanks barbara okay over to you karina I have to say, um, I always have different feelings when I when I think of things like making every day count, because I remember when my son was diagnosed and you're thinking, OK, we know what's going to happen here. We have to do everything we can to make his life amazing. And when you have day after day after week after month and you've got years ahead to do that, it can be actually quite exhausting. And so I remembered having um, my one year old twins and I mean, I was just trying to keep everybody fed and I was trying to process this and I'm like how do we make every day count like this is this is like it's too much like it's too hard and so the one of the greatest gifts was how early we went to Canuck Place because they helped us I mean every time we went there was outings there was activities um so we have albums of every, I make an al photo album of every year and every year over half that album is filled with our times at Connect Place because that's when we did things. That's when we did the pumpkin patch. That's when we got to go to a hockey game. That's when, you know, we went to the Vancouver Aquarium. And so for all of my boys that was making their everyday count as they got to enjoy time together, us as a family, but, and also we had all those memories with Heston. And so I am just so grateful um, that at a time where I just, you know, I, I didn't have the energy to even think about how can, can we get out, um, they were able to allow us to get out. And we loved our trips to Vancouver. We loved being able to see things, do things. I mean, our kids, that's where, that was our second, our vacation home to them. And so they grew up with that. And then, and it just went right through to the end where we, when we went there for end of life, it was their second home. Everyone was more than comfortable there. And we were able to really just concentrate on Heston. It wasn't a new unknown place for us. We were more than comfortable there. And we knew all the staff, we knew where everything was. And so for us, it just being, we were fed literally, and we were just basically covered with all of our needs and it we just were able to do and be with him however we wanted to do that and just to really sit and be comfortable in that and so we've yeah we've had years of making every day count and cannot place has been a huge part of that for sure that's so wonderful to hear karina i'm so glad you had those positive experiences together as a family uh, that's what the hospice is there for and that's what the palliative care team is there to help support so amazing and then over to you amy so for us i really feel and um we say this a lot to people when we explain emily's house is that they gave us a space to live and create memories um instead of just waiting and watching our daughter die um if we had stayed in the hospital we would have just been by her bedside and that would have been it and um there it was um you know creating those memories and adventures. And before we had left the hospital, once all the tubes were out, um, Nurse Stephanie had said, you know, maybe you guys wanna go down to the, to the cafeteria and maybe Grace wants to try some ice cream. And we were like, right, like there's no, like all bets are off, right? And so that really got us thinking. And so we did anything and everything we could with her. So, um, and the cool thing with, um, with hospice is they just want to facilitate that for you. So when we got there, we had said, you know, um, we wanted to do some different things. Like, what are the stipulations? What can we do? What can we do? And they're like, what do you want to do? Let's do it. And, and so we had said, you know, we'd like to have a birthday party and they're like, okay, no problem. When do you want to do it? What do you need? Do you want the, do you want to get the cake? Do you want us to get the cake? Um, and you know, when we said, okay, how many people can we invite? Like, how does that work? And they're like, we just need to know they need to sign in when they get here. And we're like, okay, so like, 
we can have 10 people. They're like, whoever you want, as long as they sign in, we're happy. And so we did a birthday party. We had big family meals, um, both of our families. So my husband's um, family and my family both got to move in. Um, so we had everybody there daily. Um, we got to watch my husband is a huge Habs fan. And so they set up the big screen and got the game so she could watch a hockey game. That was something that he had dreamed of doing with her. Um, we did sparklers outside. We took her for walks. We went shopping with her they let us go out with her and we went took her shopping um so they really just you know there was no end to what we could imagine whatever we wanted to see and do with her they would do their best to facilitate and there was I don't think we ever heard the word no um you know there might have been a few times they're like well maybe we could try doing it this way <laughs> um but they really made sure that we had as many memories as we could for as long as we could and, you know, going through pregnancy and infant loss um, and that world, especially um, later, we found out basically the best scenario they could give us was that Grace was going to be a stillbirth and we happened to catch it um, before she passed away in my stomach. And knowing so many people that have gone through that or um, gone through very early infant loss, we feel so fortunate that we have so many pictures and videos of her. Um, there'll never be enough. And um, there is a double edged sword to that because, you know, you only have so many and you wish there were more. But I have so many friends and families that have been through this that have nothing or have very little. And I have so many beautiful pictures of her. We had a photographer that was able to come in and take family pictures. Um, and it just, those memories mean everything because as time goes on, your memory, fades as well and it's hard and so having those things that you can connect to to kind of get your memory back and relive those moments in real time have just meant everything to us and we wouldn't have been um we wouldn't have had those memories had it not been for Emily's house so um the other thing I just wanted to say, it's not really part of this question but I just wanted to speak to it a little bit was what it did for us as a family um it helped us when Grace was here, um, but my husband and I saved, like they saved our lives um, and our marriage probably um, by providing us this space and giving us this time to live with her. And then the support after, you know, we received a card in the mail every month for the first year um, of the different staff who had been with us, just checking in, giving us little messages, um, telling us that they miss Grace, um, the different memorials that they do, um, you know, just they really stay connected. Like they are family. Um, and I'll never forget um, when Grace did die. And once we, again, we were given as much time, um, there was no rush. And when we did take her to walk her out, um, everyone that was there and a bunch of the staff, I guess, were called as well that had been with us because um, everybody seemed to be there, even though it was like 11 o'clock at night and they were just all lined up and you know, watching her and the tears, like, it, it's just, they're such a family. And, uh, you know, there's some of them are no longer with Emily's house, they've moved on um, and we still stay in contact. And it, there's just such that that bond that they give you and the hope and the support both during that time and after um, I just it's something that's incredible and I don't know how they do it every day um, but I'm really glad that they do. Thank you so much Amy that um, is not easy to talk about and to relive all those experiences but um, I think Grace's legacy will live on forever and I'm happy that you have these photos and things to uh, cherish and I'm sure you're a really great support to those who do not have as many like you mentioned but um, I'm, I know that you're a really good resource to others who go through these things so thank you for all that you do Amy. So we're coming up to our last question here. Um, so there's many myths and misconceptions that exist surrounding pediatric palliative care. It's, of course, a field that we wish did not have to exist, but the reality is, is that it does and that it's needed and necessary to support families um, and patients. So how has your perception of palliative care for children changed now that your family has experienced it? So I think I... Um... 
I made reference to the fact that I used to think it was just for end of life care and now I understand that's not. Um, so that was great. Um, I think the other thing is that uh, when I when you make that transition from being in care with your child and you're hoping for a cure and you're hoping for a recovery uh, and then you start to understand that that's um, maybe not going to be possible you start to hope for different things so um, and that was um, I guess it's a way of kind of accepting that there's a death coming but I uh, and yet trying to balance that with never giving up hope and always expecting a miracle you know like it's really difficult but I did start to hope for different things. I started to hope for relief from suffering because um, Jasper's end of life was particularly painful and his symptoms difficult to manage. So I began to hope for different things. And then the things that I hope for um, in most part, Connect Place was able to deliver. So, um, and so I think that's important to understand about palliative care is that, it provides a kind of care that you don't really understand you need until you need it. And then you're really grateful that it's there. So um, yeah, I think that that's really the, it was the biggest um, takeaway for me around that. Um, and yeah, everything else is just kind of life learnings that come from being a, a brief parent, which, which don't particularly um, pertain to hospice care other than that, having had a very supported experience with the end of life of your child kind of makes it possible for you to entertain those difficult questions and survive and embrace life yourself afterwards and talk to other people about it and um, provide support to others. And I don't think if you, if you have to go through that experience without that supported care, then you spend a lot of the rest of your life trying to get to that place and it, uh, it's difficult. So, uh, so the care that you get during that time, it really sets a foundation for how you cope and manage and live the rest of your own life. So. And I know, Barbara, you have a lot of experience um, and you're really involved now in other committees and stuff. So I'm sure that you're a really great support to others as well, similar to these other lovely ladies here. Over to you, Karina. Yeah, I totally agree with Barbara that I would have thought um, palliative care hospice would be just end of life. I, I had no idea that it was something that they could help us navigate for years. Um, I didn't know anyone with, had a child with um, that kind of an illness. So for me, it was just not even on my radar. Um, I think for, for me, one of the biggest um, things that I've learned is just what a gift it was to my boys. Um, like it was, it was so helpful for my husband and I, I mean, we, we loved having the respite. We, we needed that. Um, but you know, I look back and I think just how my boys, like how important, um, like their last day was there for them. And I remember my one son saying, I need to take a very special stuffy because this is a very special stay because they knew it Heston's life was going to end. And when that happened, that Canuck place wouldn't be where we would go anymore. And to them, that was family time. Like that's when we had time to spend together as a family. That's when they got to go and do things. And it, it was just such a special place to them. And so I think, um, I remember one of my twins saying, um, they were chatting with their friend at school and they were saying, well, um, can I place children's hospice? It's like a hospital, but better. Like, <laughs> and I had to kind of explain to them that a hospice also means end of life. And, um, but for them, I mean, they were just like, this is the best place ever. They loved going to Canuck Place. And I just, I see how meaningful that place was to them and still is. And I, I look at my older boys who were 20 or 22 and 19. And when I asked them if they wanted to come for end of life, if they wanted to be there, there was no question. They wanted to be there. They wanted to spend one last day at Canuck Place. And they just knew how important that was. And to them, I just, just to be able to see my older sons, my younger sons see differences, but also just seeing how important and how special their experiences and their memories were of that place. Um, it was just something that I'll, I'll always take away. Amazing, Karina, thank you. And then over to you, Amy. Um, so for me, I had never, and my husband, we had never 
really, uh, other than thinking it was somewhere that older people went, um, kind of to get out of the hospital before they died, that was kind of our take on what palliative care was in hospice. Um, and it's so, so much more than that. <laughs> and, uh, you know, it, it's just such an incredible space that's filled with just so much love and life. And it's, it's kind of comical that a place that, you know, is meant for death and end of life is filled with so much life. And um, it doesn't feel dark. It doesn't feel sad. Um, and it's still one of my favorite places to go, um, you know, through the pandemic when we couldn't do the in-person um, garden memorial it was crushing because it was like something else taken away from you and you know we realized then how much the actual physical space meant to us and our family and um we've since had another child and he'll obviously never get to meet his sister um but it's a space that he gets to go and he associates it with grace and it's not a sad place for him to go it's you know he's excited to go there and he knows that his sister lived there and he meets these people that knew his sister and um, it's just, yeah, it, it's a magical place for somewhere you never want to have to be. And, um, you know, I think people don't want to talk about kids dying, but it happens and people need to know that these incredible spaces exist. Um, I think too, I mean, we never dealt with respite, but you see these parents um, and you see these ladies who, did have respite and like the love and care and time that they put into that and there's somewhere that they can help them and you know there's so many parents that I probably think that they have to do it on their own that they don't trust other people to do it they don't trust maybe the medical system but hospice is so different um and you know I just I'll I'll talk to anybody that will hear me about hospice and, you know, it, and it might not be for everybody and it might not be a good fit for some families, but I think just making sure that you are aware of those options that for, you know, for um, the medical professionals that are dealing with families that are going down that route, that they at least let them know and let them choose, right? Um, because it could be the perfect place and it could literally change the outcome of your life and how your life proceeds um, from there on. And after those traumatic events, um, you know, they, it, your life can go very different ways. And I'm just very blessed and very thankful that we had Emily's house there to, you know, get us through that and to then provide the life that we now have. And it will never bring Grace back. And it is always going to hurt. Um, you know, none of us are ever going to be like, yeah, we're over it. You never get over that. It's not supposed to happen. Um, but we were able to receive this incredible care and this incredible time um, in these incredible places. So. Thank you, Amy. Um, and thank you, Karina and Barbara, for sharing your stories today. It's not easy to have to relive these experiences, um, but I am happy that you're all here today and that you were able to talk to us. I know I personally learned so much from each and every one of you today, and I'm sure um, others have as well. And I know personally, I'm gonna take these um, things that I've learned uh, from all of you into my daily practice um, as a palliative care nurse. So thank you so, so much. I can't even express my thanks to all of you. Um, I am gonna pass it over to Kat because she might be able to lead us through some questions that some others have in the chat. Hi everyone, I'm back. Um, so again, I wanna echo what Celine just shared. Thank you so much for sharing your experiences. Uh, you know, that's reflected as well in some of the comments that we got throughout the webinar, thanking you for uh, being brave and vulnerable and for sharing and helping us learn more about your experiences and about your children and your memories together. Um, so we got a few questions uh, that came through. Actually, oh boy, a lot more questions. So we may not be able to get to all of them, uh, but we'll do our best. Uh, one uh, question that came in from a family member uh, of a child is, "How did you manage the strangeness that can be uh, that can happen when family of origin and friends kind of distance themselves from you and your kiddo? How do you explain that to them?" Probably. 
uh, you know, a bit more so for Barbara and Karina, since your children were a bit older and, uh, but also Amy, if you experienced any of that, was there anything that uh, you might be able to uh, offer for uh, advice? Um, I can just share our experiences. So we, we had that, we had um, one grandparent um, really be sort of inappropriate or withdraw, you know, um, and our son was mature, so he could see it. So it wasn't really anything we had to explain to him. Um, he could see it. Uh, and I, I would just say that, that people's ability to cope with this sort of devastating situation vary. Um, and it's maybe not a reflection of how much they love you, but just their own coping skills. And um, so what our son did was really focus on the people who did step up and he just embraced all of those people and a lot of people did like in large numbers the community stepped up even strangers and he was able to just sort of um, shift to taking support from where it was offered and there was a lot of it so um, I will also say that surprisingly as he neared end of life even though he was talking about going home still um, he was less and less interested in seeing people outside of just his mom and dad so we actually had his very best friend come by for a visit because he was going on a trip and he didn't want to see him. He was kind of irritated that he had showed up at Connect Place and uh, and that had happened with another um, family friends too that had showed up to have lunch with us in the garden and he wasn't interested. So there's a thing that happens, I think you can see it more, I think as children are more mature where they kind of withdraw as they become close to end of life anyways and they're not really seeking for that support. They're looking to their closest support system which for us was just uh, his parents basically just him my husband and I so in terms of yeah so I didn't have to explain it to him <laughs> um I can just add a little bit my son was nonverbal, and um you know his his regression of disease uh, meant that he didn't his um developmental level mentally was about a nine month level so for people who didn't know him it he sometimes they were um unsure. Um, my family, we weren't familiar with um, any child with disabilities at all. So when he was first diagnosed, it was kind of a bit of a shock to that kind of rippled through my family. And what's amazing is over the years of um, him growing and them spending time with him, I mean, everyone fell in love with him. And the ripple effect was the opposite in that he just helped, um, whether it's, you know, aunts, uncles, cousins, I mean, they all have uh, a, a heart for kids with disabilities way more than they ever did just by knowing him. And I, I think that obviously some people were way more natural, whether it was friends, whether it was family, and some people just, they showed their love in, in different ways. And I just, I learned to just accept that everyone's doing their best and just to allow um, him to make a difference and whether that shows up with the person who just would, you know, embrace him physically, or whether that showed up with someone who, who wanted to help out at a fundraiser. Um, everyone did what they could do. Um, and I just tried to accept people where they were at with that. Um, so we're coming up on the end of the time, but I want to uh, pop in one more question. Um, when mom was sharing about the, the longevity of the process feels really overwhelming and feels quite isolating. And uh, she was wondering how you all dealt with the emotions of, I don't know if I can keep doing this. Uh, you know, if you have one or two things that you'd like to share and then we'll have to wrap up unfortunately, but um, thank you for every, uh, to everyone for asking all of those questions. So I, I didn't feel this personally. Um, there was a real up and down to our, you know, treatment path, times when things were looking good. And, and then um, I think that once, once my son had his terminal diagnosis, I think he was given between four and eight months and he was gone in two. So longevity of having to deal with those feelings wasn't necessarily a problem for me, other than that I remember at a point talking to our psychologist about the fact that I was actually grieving and he was still alive. Um, and that anticipatory grief was a bit of a um, mind game for me so but I had a psychologist to help me work through it and that person had been assigned to me as part of our hospital team or treatment team so I think the only thing that I would highly highly recommend is just whatever 
mental and emotional health resources are available to you either through hospice, through friends and family in your community, through the hospital, just latch on to them in every shape and form you can and let them help you work through those feelings. So. I would say that um, at the time I, I knew things were heavy I, and even now, obviously, but I remember thinking, this is just so hard. Like, I don't know how I, I can keep going, um, but I didn't have a choice. I had to keep going. I mean, I was this caregiver. I just, so sometimes that, you know, you just put things in the back of your mind and you just go. And now looking back, I think, how did I do that? Once you have the, the break from care, once you have time to kind of breathe, I look back and think, man, that was so, so hard. And I don't know how, I just continued. And, um, but I still sometimes don't know how I did, but just any help, that's why like things like Connect Place or like any, any help you can find, anytime you could just, you give yourself grace. Like today I need this, today I just need to, sit for this moment and to breathe. I need to not add this extra thing if it's not needed. Um, there was lots of times where I just had to be like, I, what, what can we get done today? What is the most important? And that's what we're going to do. And, you know, maybe not making every moment count every day, but just doing what you need to do. And um, I look back and think there's so many beautiful things that that I learned so many beautiful things that we are memories with him, but um, it was hard and there, there's no way around that. And, and I, I, um, I don't think I realized even how hard it was until I no longer had to do some of those things. Well, thank you so much for sharing everything uh, today. It's been invaluable. And just like Celine uh, shared, I, definitely took a lot away from this conversation. I just want to uh, take a few moments to wrap up. Um, so again, thank you everyone for joining. Uh, I hope you all can see my screen properly. Um, and we have uh, resources compiled, like I mentioned, uh, on CHPCA's website uh, at chpca.ca slash HPC for children. Uh, you can also find out more about National uh, Children's Hospice Palliative Care Day. Um, and we will be making the recording of this webinar available on our resource repository as well. And tomorrow as well is Hats On for Children's Palliative Care. It's put on by uh, the international, uh, oh, now just because I want to say it, I can't think of the name of the organization, ICPCN, uh, an international network for pa pediatric palliative care um, to strengthen awareness of the need for more pediatric palliative care services around the world. Uh, so we encourage everyone to uh, engage with that campaign and uh, as well. Uh, so just thank you to our presenting sponsor for this webinar, Children's Healthcare Canada, and for the other uh, campaign sponsors, GSK and Purdue. We greatly appreciate their support. Uh, and if you wanna do your part to support increasing access to pediatric palliative care, uh, you can donate to CHPCA at chpca.ca slash donate, uh, and uh, we'll continue to advocate for better access to pediatric palliative care because we want more families uh, who are in similar situations to Amy, Barbara, and Karina's families to be able to access the level of care that they received. Uh, and Or you can volunteer for a local organization that serves children. Uh, there are tons of ways to get involved. Um, and we hope you all uh, get to celebrate the amazing work that palliative care teams provide for families and children across Canada. Thank you for those of you who are on here, willing to learn, and uh, we hope to see you next year again for next year's National Children's Hospice Palliative Care Day. Thanks, everybody.